research shows that most of us desire revenge when we think we've been wronged. This desire for vengeance is driven by anger and a sense of injustice, as well as by a desire for satisfaction and settling the score. And fascinatingly, neuroscience research is revealing that there are some intriguing differences between people who choose to take revenge versus those who choose to forgive in terms of their brain activity. In this video, we will explore the differences that have been discovered, we will look at how these decisions can be manipulated using technology, and we will discover how achieving revenge, rather than making us feel better, can actually backfire in surprising ways on our brains. Humans are a highly social species, and we are able to live in much larger social groups compared to other animals. This has required us to evolve a high level of cooperation with other humans, and consequently most people firmly believe that antisocial behaviours and aggression are immoral behaviours to engage in. However, despite this strong need for social cohesion at the individual and societal level, research shows that when people people perceive themselves as having been wronged by another person, that revenge fantasies are surprisingly common across the population, as well as some form of covert retaliatory aggression. Here, whilst most of us don't retaliate in physically aggressive ways, people do commonly engage in more subtle and inventive methods to sabotage or hurt the person who has wronged them. This is called indirect aggression and this kind of aggression can be quite clever. For example, indirect aggression can include behaviours like lying, gossiping, or the destruction of property, and is often called malevolent creativity. However, whether the aggression is overt or covert, research indicates that the motivation that is underlying these kinds of vengeful behaviours is a desire for catharsis. That is to say, a desire to release negative and stressful emotions that have been generated as a result of the perceived wrongdoing. This is called the catharsis theory of aggression, and it was argued about a century ago by Sigmund Freud. Since this time, various experiments have been invented to probe how people react to perceived injustice from others, in experiments which are designed to provoke participants. Within these provocation experiments, participants experience unfair treatment, mocking, or even physical pain at the hands of another participant, and they can either cooperate in response, or they can retaliate in some way in order to avenge themselves. Examples of these provocation paradigms include the Taylor Aggression Paradigm, the Prisoner's Dilemma, and the Ultimatum Game. And across the years, various neuroscientists have also utilised these same paradigms, while measuring the brain activity of participants during the provocation, as well as during their decisions to either cooperate or retaliate. And within these provocation paradigms, two things are noted to happen within the participants' brains. In response to provocation, a part of the brain activates called the amygdala, this is a region that is located deep within the brain, and it generates the emotion of anger, and consequently is strongly associated with aggressive behaviour in general. Secondly, there is another part of the brain which activates that is called the insula. This is yet another brain region that is involved in processing negative emotions, but is also critical for processing pain whether the pain is emotional or physical. Therefore, both the amygdala and the insula activate and generate the unpleasant emotions that must be purged, under the catharsis theory of aggression. And as we shall see, within these provocation paradigms, neuroscientists have found that those who choose to take revenge show specific brain activity.
Within these provocation paradigms, people make different choices about whether they will cooperate or retaliate after provocation. We will call those who choose to retaliate the Avengers within the rest of the video. Here the Avengers have been found in these experiments to exhibit even stronger activity within their amygdala and insula, compared with those who do not retaliate. In addition, the Avengers also show heightened activity within another brain area called the ventral striatum. The ventral striatum is located within the limbic system at the centre of the brain and it forms a crucial part of the brain's reward system, in that it activates whenever you experience pleasurable things, and it also activates whenever you expect to experience them. This is because the ventral striatum has receptors for the neurotransmitter called dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter that primarily codes for future rewards, and drives motivation to pursue reward, even when there are also undesirable consequences for doing so. Accordingly, the ventral striatum receives dopamine when something rewarding is anticipated, and when the ventral striatum receives this dopamine, the ventral striatum then goes on to influence your decision making and behaviour through its connections with your motor system, meaning the parts of your brain that generate movement. In this way, the ventral striatum serves as a limbic motor interface in order to guide behaviour to toward the rewarding outcome. And fascinatingly, those who choose to take revenge on other participants show elevated activity within the ventral striatum which is therefore likely to make revenge seem even more desirable. This therefore suggests that the decision to take revenge is driven by elevated activity not only within anger and pain areas, but also in areas which drive the pursuit of reward. This therefore aligns with the catharsis theory of aggression, in that acts of retaliation are driven by the desire to purge the unpleasant emotions. This also corresponds with research which shows that those who choose to take revenge hold the belief that doing so will indeed bring them catharsis. But what about the brains of those who do not choose to take revenge, but choose to rise above it instead? Within the provocation experiments, and in contrast to the Avengers, people who choose not to retaliate show more brain activity in totally different brain areas, namely in regions at the front of the brain, which is an area called the frontal lobes. In general, your frontal lobes are incredibly important for driving and regulating your behaviour, and they do this by inhibiting many of your emotional and behavioural responses. In addition, your frontal lobes are split into different regions, one of which is called the lateral prefrontal cortex. Here, your lateral prefrontal cortex is connected to your amygdala, insula, and ventral striatum. And as you may therefore guess, the brains of those who chose not to retaliate had lateral prefrontal cortices that showed heightened activity during the provocation. And this heightened lateral prefrontal cortex activity therefore inhibited and reduced the activity of these anger, pain and reward areas. And accordingly, these experiments have also found that when the amount of activation within the lateral prefrontal cortex was stronger than the activation within the insula, amygdala, and ventral striatum, that the participant was more likely to forgive and to refrain from retaliation. Therefore, the activation of the lateral prefrontal cortex during provocation is thought to reduce the feelings of anger and pain, as well as reduce the desire for catharsis, thereby decreasing the likelihood that the person will choose revenge. And fascinatingly, this has also been supported by additional experiments in which neuroscientists were able to alter the decision making of the participants using a technique called repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, or RTMS. Here RTMS applies electromagnetic pulses to the scalp, 
and in doing so it enables researchers to either decrease or increase the activity of different brain areas. By applying either low frequency or high frequency stimulation respectively, and in an experiment performed by Dr. Martin Brunner and his team, it was found that by using RTMS to reduce activity within the lateral prefrontal cortex, that this made participants more likely to choose to take revenge. Altogether, this suggests that people who are more forgiving, or who are more cooperative, may have stronger lateral prefrontal cortices, which may therefore provide them with stronger inhibition of anger, pain and reward areas throughout their daily lives, an ability that is seemingly weaker in Avengers' brains. Therefore, under the catharsis theory, it would appear that people who choose to take revenge do so in order to achieve what their lateral prefrontal cortex is not. In other words, in an attempt to diminish the activity of anger and pain areas, and ultimately, to bring peace of mind. But is revenge actually successful at achieving this? As has already been discussed, many people believe that getting revenge will bring them catharsis. However, over the decades a series of experiments have challenged this view, and in one particularly interesting fMRI experiment conducted by Dr. Brad Bushman and his team, participants were repeatedly provoked and given the chance to take revenge. And in addition, the participants were also instructed to complete mood forms about how angry they felt, both before and after their revenge took place. Here, within the first phase of the experiment, participants were instructed to write essays, and they were then informed that another participant had harshly criticised what they had written. Then the participants were assigned into one of three different groups, either into a rumination group, in which they were encouraged to think about the criticism that they had received while they hit a punching bag, or they were placed into a distraction group, in which they were instead told to distract themselves with thoughts of fitness. The remaining participants, however, were placed into a third group called the control group, who merely sat and waited for the next phase of the experiment to begin. Then all of the participants' anger levels were measured, and the second phase of the experiment started. Now the participants were instructed to get into an MRI scanner, and were told that they must compete with their critic to press a button. Whoever won each race to press the button would be able to choose the volume of a noise blast that the loser would be subjected to. However, unbeknownst to the participants, the critic didn't actually exist, and the other player that they thought that they were playing with was actually just the computer giving programs responses. And specifically, the computer was programmed to be as provocative and unpleasant as possible, in that it was programmed to select louder noise blasts whenever it won, and also to send mocking messages to the participant whenever it won. Therefore, whenever the participants won the race to press the button, they were able to choose whether to retaliate for the earlier criticism, as well as for the very loud noise blasts, by selecting high volume noise blasts themselves. Or alternatively, they could refrain from retaliating by selecting quieter noise blasts instead. Then finally, the participants were once again asked to provide mood ratings of how angry they felt, and paradoxically, it was observed that those who had ruminated about the criticism, and who had then retaliated against what they thought was the human wrongdoer, actually reported feeling even worse after having gotten revenge, compared to those who had instead distracted themselves with other thoughts, or who had simply sat and waited. And fascinatingly, similar findings have also been found within other experiments, such as those performed by Dr. Kevin Carl Smith in America and by Dr. Jun Jan in China, who both report that whilst achieving revenge brings immediate relief in the moment, that these positive effects are not sustained, and in fact lead to even worse mood in the long term. 
Altogether, these results therefore challenge the catharsis theory of aggression, as even though a wrongdoer may indeed deserve retaliation, that this doesn't actually result in the Avenger feeling better, as has been discovered through subsequent mood tests of the participants. But why might this occur neurologically? One of the explanations that have been given for these surprising results is the destructive impact that rumination has on one's mental health. Here, the more that we dwell on a negative experience after it has happened, the longer the experience is able to linger and sustain the pain of the wrongdoing. And what is particularly insidious about this is that repeated reinforcement of these negative thoughts and emotions can generate a powerful and persisting brain state called embitterment. Embitterment is a process of repeatedly revisiting and reprocessing an injustice long after it has been experienced, which sustains and even intensifies the pain and thoughts of the wrongdoing. Accordingly, embitterment is particularly characteristic of those who become caught up in the desire and planning of revenge, because thoughts of revenge increases the risk of embitterment in becoming entrenched within the brain, causing embitterment to persist even if revenge is finally achieved. Consequently, embitterment has been described as aggression by self-destruction. And interestingly, people differ significantly in their susceptibility to rumination, as well as to embitterment. On a pathological level, this can be observed within disorders like post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD in response to traumatic events, as well as within the lesser known disorder called post-traumatic embitterment disorder, or PTED, which occurs in response to traumatic but non-life-threatening events, such as divorce or dismissal. Here both PTSD and PTED feature deficits in the ability to suppress unwanted thoughts and emotions, which are becoming repetitive and consuming. And whilst neuroscientific research into PTED is lacking, it is well known that in PTSD, atypical brain activity exists in another brain area that is important for the generation of unwanted, intrusive, or obsessive thoughts. This area is called the hippocampus, and this area of the brain activates whenever a memory is created, as well as whenever it is remembered. And fascinatingly, the hippocampus is also known to be overactive within PTSD, and may therefore contribute to the intrusive memories and thoughts which characterise the disorder. Furthermore, PTSD is also known to be associated with an underactive lateral prefrontal cortex, as not only does the lateral prefrontal cortex inhibit anger, pain, and reward areas as we have seen, but it also inhibits the hippocampus. Here, the lateral prefrontal cortex is part of the brain's memory suppression network, and it generates a process called suppression-induced forgetting of unwanted memories. Accordingly, people have been found to be less likely to develop the symptoms of PTSD after experiencing a traumatic event if they have a stronger lateral prefrontal cortex. Therefore, it is possible that this ability of the lateral prefrontal cortex to suppress hippocampus activity may also underlie the individual variation between those who choose to take revenge versus those who choose not to, as those who are more prone to vengeful thinking may be less able to suppress their unwanted memories and the thoughts of the wrongdoing. But you can find out more about memory suppression in other videos.